All right, so that's that. Now, we're going to be talking about pain and inflammation tonight. One of the things I hope to get across, and if I don't, please remind me, is we're going to talk about pain and inflammation. Some pain and inflammation is very healthy and it's part of healing, and some pain and inflammation tears the body down. And so it's knowing when you're getting close to crossing the line, that's when you need to do something. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the symptoms, why the body does some of the things it does, and some things you can do to help the body get healthier and to help calm down inflammation and pain. We're also going to talk about some of the things a lot of us, through no fault of our own, are doing that's making pain and inflammation worse, and it doesn't have to be that way. So a lot of us are in feel worse than we need to, and a lot of what's caught driving that is the foods we eat and the way we eat or the way we cook them. So we're going to address that a little bit too. So, when something harmful or irritating affects part of our body, there's a biological response that tries to remove it. And we're talking about if you get an infection or if you get a splinter, that's a foreign body. It gets red, it can get a little infected, it hurts, and that's a real healthy healing response. That's how the body's healing. Symptoms of inflammation, especially acute inflammation, show the body's working to heal itself. So just like with a fever, sometimes when we have a fever, we take Tylenol or aspirin when it's 99 degrees. We shouldn't do that. The body's trying to get our temperature up to close to 101 and then our immune system is fully activated. So usually it'll go up, stay up, it's working, and then your fever goes down. Sometimes it goes up to 102 and 3, then you need to do something. But the same thing happens with inflammation and pain. At the beginning, if it's acute, that's the body healing or trying to heal. And if you start taking your ibuprofen or your Tylenol, that can cause problems because it takes longer to heal because the body isn't able to do what it's trying to do. So we should keep in mind that inflammation can either help us heal and rebuild or tear things down. I like this picture. It shows all the different stages of inflammation, either leading to healing or damage. Inflammation is a protective attempt to remove the injurious stimuli and initiate the healing process. You twist your knee you want it to get inflamed and you want it, well you don't want it to, it's healthy for it to get inflamed and it's healthy for it to hurt because if neither of those happened, if you didn't have a decreased mobility and it didn't hurt when you were putting pressure on it, you would keep using it and injure it further. So that's very helpful. So what we do with some of the sports players, it's like, I hate to say it, it's like they're a horse. Let's do whatever we have to do so they can win the race, and if need be, we'll take them out behind the barn and shoot them afterwards. <laughs> so you could take local anesthetics and pain pills and numb the pain in your knee, and you might have torn something, and you could keep running the marathon. But to what end? You do more damage. So remember, the pain and inflammation can be helpful. So if we start on the left side, the redness is caused by increased blood flow. And that brings in a lot more blood and oxygen and nutrients, which the body needs to heal the cells. The swelling's caused by the blood vessels start getting a little leaky, and so fluid flows out of them into the tissue. And that can be healthy because it, with all that fluid, it also brings white blood cells and a lot of the cells in from our immune system to go in there and start gobbling up whatever's there that's bad. It also brings enzymes, and we'll talk about that a little further on. And those enzymes are proteolytic enzymes. They go in there and start breaking up all the metabolic waste that's there. When there's injured tissue, we generate a lot of metabolic waste. And if that doesn't clear out, it causes more <coughs> inflammation, which eventually can turn into chronic inflammation, which then is damaging. So the swelling, even though it hampers our movement or it might hurt, 
is very healthy because it's bringing in a lot of the building blocks and the things we need for the body to heal the area. There's heat, again, that's from the increased blood flow that can help kill bacteria. It also is very soothing. We all know on a heating pad it's very, very helpful. If sometimes we have an injury, the heat feels good. Um, pain is caused by inflammatory chemicals that the body releases and we'll go into some of the names of them. It's not that important, but I have a slide in your handout and we'll be talking about it showing how the, the non-steroidals, um, ibuprofen and aspirin, where in the chemical pathway they work to block pain. And most of the time you don't want to use those. Sometimes if pain or inflammation is too high, it's very therapeutic to calm that down. And this will show where in the schematic of the body it works. So with any complaint of pain, there's always inflammation to some degree. While inflammation serves a purpose, it can always get, it sometimes can get out of control. And out of control, a chronic inflammation can only damage tissue. There's no benefit to that. Now, if you look at this slide and you have it, you can read it at home. But chronic inflammation, we have acute, which is healthy, and then it goes on, and after a certain amount of time, it goes into overdrive and becomes chronic. That's detrimental. So if we look at the slide, and I'll try to stay out of your way. If I start standing in front of you, just yell or throw something at me. Um, I'll try to block you people from that side so it will be even. But if you look at it, mental health disorders, bipolar, heart failure, um, cardiomyopathy, dementia, Parkinson's, chronic inflammatory diseases, irritable bowel disease, pancreatitis, prostatitis, diabetic complications, metabolic disorders, diabetes, heart disease, fatty liver disease, fibromyalgia, that's all tied into chronic pain. Unfortunately, we usually don't realize we're in chronic pain or we're getting there till we already crossed the line because it would be great if we could prevent it. But the sooner you figure out that this isn't just acute pain that's helping me and you start dealing with it, the easier it is to go back over the line to acute pain and get the pain to go down and the inflammation. But chronic inflammation <laughs> is behind most of the degeneration in our system. There's two types, there's two phases to inflammation. There's the attack and then heal. The first stage of inflammation is called irritation, which becomes inflammation. Tissue gets irritated, then those processes that I showed with the statues start happening and that leads to inflammation. The immediate healing process starts when we have the heat and the inflammation and that's very, very good. Um, acute inflammation is a healthy response. How do you know if it's acute or chronic? Acute inflammation starts rapidly, becomes, it can even become severe as the immune system tries to protect us from the invading organism or the damaged tissue and it tries to control the infection. Now if you think about it, going back to caveman days, which is when we were really designed, that's what we were designed for, you got injured, you couldn't go to the doctor and get an antibiotic if you got a cut, because there weren't antibiotics. Your body took care of it, and it did that by bringing the fluid into that damaged tissue, the white blood cells, the macrophages, bradykinin, even serotonin, substance P, those cause pain and it gets the body activated. It swells up, it gets red, it gets hot. That's very, very good. Very uncomfortable, but very good. Again, that's acute inflammation and it's healthy. Chronic inflammation, a long-term inflammation, is very unhealthy, can last for months or years, and it causes degeneration and death of tissue, and it leads towards cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, um, periodontis, periodontis, periodontitis, not the person who takes care of it, <laughs> and it'll bring you to them, and even something that isn't deadly, but hay fever and allergies. That's a chronic inflammation. Not if you touched poison ivy and had an acute, starts, comes real fast, and goes away. But if it's chronic, 
someone suffering from allergies all the time, that's a low-level chronic inflammation that eventually is going to do damage. Inflammation is any condition with an itis, I-T-I-S at the end, pancreatitis, prostatitis, bronchitis, usually it's acute. But if it's happening longer and longer, you're damaging tissue. Our infections, wounds, and any damage to tissue would never heal without inflammation. So it's very, very life-saving up to a point. So we don't want to be living on anti-inflammatories. And the sad part is, what if you have some chronic inflammation, there's chronic damage, you're on anti-inflammatories. That helps your knee or your shoulder. But what happens if you injure yourself? You've shut down a lot of the acute inflammation too. So you don't want to just live on those things. Sometimes it's benefit risk and you might need it, but you want to take the lowest dose that you need and you want to do whatever you can to support the body so you'll allow inflammation to occur when you need it for acute inflammation. Make sense? Okay. So I put this in your handouts just to try to help break down how do you know acute or chronic inflammation. The, in red are the real big things. It goes into the types of cells that are involved, but that's getting a little technical. If you want to read about that, great. Um, acute is a harmful bacteria or injury to tissue. It starts right away, it's short-lived, and you get better. It resolves. If it doesn't resolve, you cross the line into chronic. Chronic is a non-pathogen. It's not that an organism got in there. It's something going on that the body can't deal with. Now, it might not be able to deal with it because it's not able to. It might not, usually it's because we haven't given it what it needs to heal. We're out of balance. It usually lasts for several months to years, and the outcome is degeneration of tissue and real severe chronic inflammation causes damage to organs that we need and death can occur. That's going way to the extreme and none of us are hopefully gonna go anywhere near that line. But you really want to stay out of chronic inflammation as much as you can. Inflammation has benefits and pain has benefits too. It's really the body waving a big flag warning us, something's wrong, help me. Just like if you eat something and the food is spoiled, you get nauseous and vomit or have diarrhea. So the last thing you want to do with food poisoning at the beginning is take Imodium. You want to allow the body to get rid of that rotten food. And so if you get chronic diarrhea, then you do something. But at the beginning, you don't want to suppress it. The body's trying to do something. Same thing, same red flag, inflammation and pain. Something's wrong, do something, please help me. Not, let me shut that down. I'll take enough Motrin and the pain will go away. You have to figure out why you're having the pain. With inflammation, chemicals from the body's white blood cells are released into the blood and this is helping to protect the body from an invading organism. Some of the chemicals that cause the leak of the fluid is, and I mentioned it, the bradykinin, the substance P that helps trigger pain. The blood vessels start, the cells open up and blood leaks out. So when you get a black and blue mark, one that's a damage to capillaries, but having that blood come out of the blood vessels is very healthy because it helps heal the tissue and protect the tissue. Now the NSAIDs block the prostaglandin substance P, serotonin, histamine, and we'll talk about that um, I think in two or three slides. While it's important to understand the underlying causes painkillers can help calm down excessive and harmful inflammation. If we've crossed over and we have too much pain and too much inflammation, that's when you want to use a, an anti-inflammatory and it's something to help with the pain. Because some things that are helpful, the pain and inflammation, can also be damaging. So sometimes it, even Motrin, ibuprofen, is the proper therapy. So I don't like that, it, it stresses the liver, aspirin can eat a hole in your stomach, 
but sometimes it's the right therapy. You always have to think of the benefit and risk, and if benefit outweighs the risk, you do it short term. I'm going to be talking about there are some wonderful natural anti-inflammatories and things for pain that don't have the side effects of acetaminophen or ibuprofen. So we'll be talking about those tonight too. Pain and inflammation can result whenever there's an imbalance in the body. And we do a lot of it to ourselves. Digestion and detox, if there's an imbalance there, if your digestive system, the gut isn't working well, that's pro-inflammation. Poor blood sugar control, when blood sugar goes up and down, insulin is highly inflammatory in the body. It's very healthy in the right amounts, but if it goes into excess, it fuels inflammation. Too many oxidants versus antioxidants. And I have a couple of slides on that. What's the difference between the two? Well, um, if you have too many oxidants, those are free radicals. They damage tissue. So if there's too many of them, you're getting damaged all the time. Um, probably 20 years ago, Time Magazine had their cover showed they were talking about cholesterol and statins 20 years ago and it showed a heart a human heart with flames coming out of it and the fire within I don't know if any of you yeah. remember seeing that the medical profession sort of you know we have statins we don't have to worry about anything what they found is that a lot of people the cholesterol plaques that are building up are due to inflammation and due to the lining of the blood vessel getting damaged. And that's from too many free radicals, oxidants. We manufacture huge amounts of, of oxidants, of free radicals, just in a good, normal, every day of living. And we're supposed to have a bunch of antioxidants that protect the body from it. And if they don't protect it, if we don't have enough antioxidants, or we're making too many free radicals, we damage protein in our body and the lining of our blood vessels and our muscles and all of our tissues are made out of protein. And there's the free radicals when you're in the sun, if someone's in the sun too long and they get that leather, leathery skin, that's due to free radical damage to too many oxidants. The ultraviolet light causes a lot of free radicals to be made. When we eat white flour and white sugar and the bad foods, it's pro-inflammatory. It makes an explosion of oxidants, of free radicals. Mm -hmm. And if you're eating all that lousy food, that means you're not eating the good food. And the good foods have the antioxidants. They're the ones that protect us. So the free radicals aren't bad if they're balanced by the good food. So some of us go out and buy all this good food and we make a delicious soup with all these fresh vegetables, mm. nice and thick, and we go out and we get organic vegetable broth and all the fruit, all the vegetables <coughs> are organic and free range chicken and we throw that in. We make it and we put it in containers and have them in the freezer so we don't have to go to McDonald's for lunch. And then we come to work, take the soup, put it in the microwave for two minutes. You destroy all the enzymes that nature put in, the fruit and vegetables, to help us digest the food and you kill most of the vitamins. So you did all that good work and we didn't have the three minutes or five minutes to heat it up on top of the stove. So and I'm guilty of that every once in a while, <laughs> you're in a rush. So just go ahead and go to McDonald's in that case. Save money. You're going down the wrong road, you might as well go flying down the road. All right? So as sometimes you have to microwave. Well, you don't have to. Sometimes we microwave. But you microwave should be used very sparingly. You can heat water in it because there's no good nutrition in water. But eat the <coughs> food. Nature gave us all this good stuff to protect us from getting ignited and be burning up. All right. Um, diet's important to extinguish inflammation and reduce the inflammatory mediators that lead to pain. If for people who don't think that's true, I'll say, I'll challenge all of you and I hope most of you won't do it because it isn't healthy. But if you go home and for the next 48 hours eat much gluten, white flour, white sugar, and see how you feel, then stop. Eliminate it completely for 48 hours 
and then go back, have a big bowl of pasta, some nice garlic bread, a couple of beers, or eat a whole pizza, and all that. And then let me know how you feel. The problem is when we eat the white flour, white sugar, and too much gluten, our energy level is down here, and we're very bloated and exhausted. But since there's so much gluten, and white flour, and white sugar in most things we're eating, this is our normal. But it really isn't. Our energy should be up here. So when someone eliminates it for 48 hours and then has that heavy load, you, your energy was going up and you were feeling great, and then you slam it down and you really notice the difference. Whereas if you just say, I have more people that say, gluten doesn't bother me, white flour and white sugar, I can eat whatever I want, it doesn't change anything. That's because you're in a rotten place to begin with. <laughs> There's not too much further to go down. And if you did go down further, you wouldn't know you were feeling lousy because we'd be planting you. And we don't want to be doing that. Okay, it's been a long day. Um, the seeds of chronic inflammation and a lot of health issues start with the gut. And any of you that have been to any of our lectures, or even in the newspaper now, everything begins and ends in the gut. That's where we break down the food, nourish the body, and poop out the waste product. So if you're constipated or have diarrhea, you're not cleaning out the body efficiently. If you're constipated, the food can't work its way down, so you're not absorbing the nutrients. So again, you're wasting all this good food. And usually, a lot of it has to do with either diet choices, or it has to do with, I have a lot of people I work with that will say, the last five years, I have been eating perfectly. How come I have IBS? And so then we start talking, well, how were you from college to 50? Oh. I ate anything I wanted, but I didn't have a problem till now, and when I had a problem, that's when I cleaned up my diet. How come I feel lousy? I've been eating great for six months. How about you have to clean up the mess of 20 years? Eventually, we cross the line. The body just, when you have a symptom, it's not that something started then. It was the body finally gave up. It just couldn't deal with it any longer. So the problem, I always talk to people, what was going on before the symptoms started because that's where the imbalance is, whatever we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you have intestinal bloating, de oh, I said I was going to block you for a while, <laughs> and, um, diarrhea, constipation, gas, pain, heartburn, acid reflux, and food sensitivities and allergies, that's probably what? Some of this is 60, 70% of the population? That's coming from the gut. And until you get the digestive system working, nothing's going to work. You're not going to be able to get healthier because you can't nourish and you can't take out the garbage. And so, you know, digestive system, we talk about it all the time. Some, okay, we'll go with acid reflux. First thing they usually do is put you on Zantac and you take it twice a day, or now they're using Prilosec. And so you take something that's supposed to last 24 hours. It works for a while, then you still have reflux. So they tell you to take Zantac in between. So now you're suppressing the acid even further. That works for a while, and then it starts coming out again. So they say, well, take some Tums in between the Zantac, in between the Prilosec. That should be telling you, I was suppressing something, and it's getting worse. Not that the, you got used to the drugs. It was the underlying problem. Now those drugs aren't strong enough to suppress it. We eat, we chew up the food, goes into the stomach, mixes with acid. When it's mixed well, goes into the intestines and starts moving at a, in a timely manner, disassembly, plant through the intestines. Different times, different enzymes get dropped in. Nature was very smart. We're back to cavemen again, which we're going to keep going back to because that's where it all started. Nature didn't want to make our enzymes active because they dissolve, part of, a lot of them digest protein. So what would happen? We eat, and the body gets ready to drop the enzymes into the intestines because it knows the food's coming. We're eating. And it's a timely manner, and it'll get down there. And so the food bolus is there, the enzymes drop in, and they digest, we'll say, the protein. What happens if you're all set to eat and a lion comes by? If the enzymes drop in and you're running for 20 minutes away from the lion, 
those enzymes need something to break down. The only thing in the intestines at that point is the intestines, and it would start digesting the intestines. So what nature did was she made them almost active. It needs a certain pH, a certain acidity in the food to activate them. So if that happens, you don't have a problem where you're digesting yourself. So now we're taking the acid blockers and we block a lot of the acid and so the enzymes don't get fully activated. So one, you didn't have the acid working on the food as well as it should be. And then when it gets into the intestines, the, the enzymes don't work as well. So what happens? You get bloated and the gas smells. That's the food rotting or fermenting instead of digesting. So also the brain says, I'm not, I didn't get the nutrients I needed. I didn't get the blood sugar I needed out of that food. So even if your stomach's out to here because you're full, you haven't digested it well, so the brain says, I'm hungry. So you start grazing, even though, and we've all experienced that. How many people eat when they're full? Because you feel hungry. And that's because the brain isn't getting the signal that it got the nutrients it needed. And so you wind up eating a lot more calories to get the nutrients in to fuel the body. So digestion, very, very important. Also another interesting thing with the prolosec and all that, since the body isn't digesting well, if the food rots, the body gives you diarrhea, but if it doesn't rot, the body slows down the elimination, makes you constipated because it wants to leave the food there longer <coughs> to try to extract more nutrients out of it. And so the Prilosec and Zantac, very good short term if you have the beginning of an ulcer, but it's not the answer. Food sensitivities and allergies to food. As the gut gets out of balance, you have bigger openings and you start absorbing things that weren't supposed to be absorbed. That causes the immune system to do its job. A foreign <coughs> invader came in. It might be a piece of chicken that's supposed to be two molecules big when it gets absorbed and it's six molecules. That's a foreign substance. Your immune system goes into overdrive to protect you. And now you start reacting to different foods. And then the body can't eliminate these things, so it comes out through the skin. So eczema, psoriasis, acne, that's all based, Chinese have been saying it for 2,000 years from the digestive system. Any questions on that? So gut is very, very important. While we're talking gut, digestion's a mess, so what do you do? You start craving different foods. You want the sub, you want pizza, you want pasta, you want the simple foods, the white flour foods. You crave sugar because blood sugar's dropping. That just feeds the imbalance even further, and you spin more out of control. And those foods are very inflammatory. So you have a chart, type, somebody asked a question beforehand, what are good foods to eat for inflammation and what are bad foods? You want to, it's gonna be sort of backwards, these things increase inflammation in the body. So you wanna decrease these in your diet and you wanna increase the ones on the right. On the right is right, you know, it's good. You, Omega-3s, a lower cholesterol diet, low glycemic index foods, fiber, arginine, th fish and nuts. Mod not, you should be drinking moderately amount, moderate amounts of alcohol. Don't drink too much alcohol. If you don't drink, you don't have to start drinking to get inflammation <laughs> down. And physical activity. You want to cut down smoking. That just loads the body with toxins, which are very inflammatory. Excess alcohol, even excess exercise. Exercise is life-saving. Exercise is very healthy. Too much exercise tears the body down, causes inflammation, generates so many free radicals that the body can't deal with it, which causes more damage. So you need to, even a good thing, too much of a good thing, it can become a bad thing. Also, trans fats, saturated fats, white flour, white sugar, pro-inflammatory. Anyone with arthritis, have them cut out the bad foods and then dump them back in and they won't believe how much pain they feel and how much better they felt when they took it out. Yes? Yeah, is there a list? Somebody should get a list exactly what trans, facet, trans fatty acids foods are and saturated fatty acids. I just don't know what specific foods they are. That's a if you, okay, if you go online, you'll you can get reams of it. But the main thing, 
the trans fatty acids, that's all the man-made fats. Most prepared foods have the bad fats, the hydrogenated fats, they're trans fatty acids. So you want to eat, if you eat real food, you don't have to worry about the left side. If you eat processed food, you're living in that. Now just a simple example, we all know too much beef is very bad for us, right? Even beef is bad for you. It's loaded with saturated, unhealthy fat. And that's what makes it taste so good, we thought. So the farmers or the ranchers fatten up the steers right at the end to make the meat more tender. If you take that same steer and have it grazed out in the field, you're not feeding it corn, and you're not having it live in a pen, there's very little omega-6 in the fat and most of the fat is omega-3. <coughs> omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. It causes inflammation. The beef industry, the, um, I don't know how to call it, the not free-range beef, you know, the ones that are fed cornmeal and all that. Yeah. In, thank you. Um, conventional beef is loaded with omega-6. That's why it causes the heart problems. Whereas if you ate the same animal that was allowed to live the way it was supposed to, like I'm saying, let's eat the real food. Let them eat the real food. It's amazing. The fat, you can have a nice marbled piece of beef, and if it was free-range beef, that's all omega-3, just like what's in wild Alaskan salmon. Because they're out there chasing the real food. But if the salmon that we get that's farm-raised, now it's better than it was, but originally they were feeding cornmeal to the original farm raised salmon. What salmon eats corn in the wild? <laughs> and, it's, and it's genetically modified corn on top of that. So when the animals eat what nature intended, it's healthier for us to eat them. So if we even take that a step closer to us, if we eat the foods we were supposed to be eating, that has all the good things and not much of the bad, but when we change it, why do we put omega-6 in all of our baked goods and all of our prepared foods? Anyone know? Preservative? Well, not indirectly, yes, preservative. The reason we did that was, any of you bake, and, or I remember mom or grandma making bread at home, if you took a homemade loaf of good bread or a, a homemade muffin that was made the old way, and you left it out on the counter overnight, it would be hot as a rock the next day. Up until recently, and I won't use a name, but one of the big donut places in the area, they had delicious muffins, and you could leave it out of the bag for days and it would be moist and soft. And that's because it had hydrogenated fats in it. Good fats go bad. They're very delicate and they go rancid fast. We, the consumer, demanded it. We wanted very cheap, and we wanted to be able to buy stuff we could put in the cabinet and pull out six, eight months later when we had company and it would be fresh. <laughs> Whereas if you go to Whole Foods or Stop and Shop or any of the stores in the healthy area, the crackers that you buy might only have a, a two month or a three month expiration and if you open it up at the end, it smells rancid. It is rancid. The fat in there, the good fat, the omega-3 that they used went bad. So we wanted, you know, buy a Triscuit and you can, you know, two years from now, a saltine's probably <laughs> 10 years, they're gonna be crisp and delicious. If you think of Crisco, that's the king or the queen of hydrogenated fat. That is pretty gross. It makes some good, I remember when I was a kid, some of the cookies you needed to use Crisco, but, and we ate them. But there's better ways to do it now. But if you took, we did an experiment with some kids in school, some elementary school kids. We had them walk around on the floor on their hands, you know, with their hands. So the floor is, dis any floor is disgusting, right? Then we had them each take their hand and put ham imprints on top of New jars of Crisco. We opened it up and they <laughs> and put the hand in. We covered it and waited a month. Opened it up, nothing grew. Even for bacteria, there's nothing there for it to live on. Whereas if you take grandma's old, old fashioned bread or muffins or cookies and you left it out 
for a few days out of the refrigerator, there'd be mold growing on it. Because even the mold knows something nutritious there, let's eat it. So, Mitch, there's the difference, good fat, bad fat. Another way to tell a good, for the most part, good fats, even if you stick them in the refrigerator, coconut oil is an exception, won't congeal and get solid. Whereas a bad fat, as it gets a little cooler, turns to lard. And Crisco at 100 degrees is solid. And so that should tell us something, okay? Margarine, margarine is, should be outlawed. It's the worst fat in the world. Well, Crisco is the worst. Next to the worst, we should be using butter. Butter has cholesterol. Cholesterol got a bad name, so butter and eggs were on the do not eat list. Unless you're eating huge amounts of butter, margarine is killing you. So eat the butter, it tastes better. And how much butter do you eat? You shouldn't be putting it an inch thick on your toast, on your white bread toast. <laughs> you know, there's better things to eat. So everything in moderation. And you know, when you think about it, it's funny, but it's pretty sad what, we, what we're doing to ourselves because we know better. You know, what tastes better than homemade multi-grain bread or how many people go out to eat and you finally f you know you're on vacation you find a restaurant you order a sandwich and it comes on inch thick bread and you pick up half the sandwich and it weighs three pounds that bread is so dense and heavy and it's delicious and it holds you for four or five hours whereas back home you make a sandwich a half hour later you're hungry there's more nutrients in the real grains why don't we do that it costs more to buy and you can't buy the big loaf because by the time you eat it all, it's going to be stale because it goes bad. Whereas if it's made with the bad fats, you know, Wonder Bread, you know, that's good for what? Forever, almost. <laughs> and so, you know, we just have to think, how about buying smaller amounts and shopping a little more often? We should buy all of our food like we buy our perishables. You should buy enough for a week. And it should be bad, gone by the end of the week, but if it isn't, and it's going bad, you deserve to throw it out. Go shopping and buy more and buy less. You know, buy more often, because you want real food. Okay, there's a few natural alternatives to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the NSAIDs, to go along with a good anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle. Yes? I wanted to squeeze in a question before you move Sure. Column two, that seems to be suggesting that moderate alcohol intake will reduce that, I, and I, it's written wrong, as opposed to excessive alcohol. Oh, you want to so cut news. it down, okay? <laughs> but, you know, and then we go into studies, we'll digress a little. How many remember coffee causes heart attacks and high blood pressure? Don't drink coffee, drink decaf. So we all went over here and drank decaf. But the way we decaffeinate it is with a carcinogen that's going to cause cancer. You're better off having high blood pressure and not cancer. So drink coffee. Don't drink more than four ounces, a little cup of coffee every day. Don't have any more than that. It's bad for you. Now the study is if you drink coffee for guys, four to six cups a day, lo lower chance of heart problems, longer life, decreased um, prostate inflammation. You might be up all night. but. <laughs> Everything in moderation. If you're going to drink coffee, I drink coffee, I love coffee. I have a couple cups a day, but now I'm buying, it's a little more expensive, I'm buying organic coffee because I don't, if I'm, maybe the coffee isn't the best thing in the world for me, but I don't want to have all the chemicals in it in addition to the stimulation from the caffeine if that's not good for you. So everything in moderation. And we, you can do some bad things once in a while if you're doing a lot of good things. Do I never eat white bread? I haven't had Wonder Bread probably since I was a kid eating a Fluffernutter. I haven't had a Fluffernutter in God knows how long, thank God. But um, I live a little west of here. There's a wonderful <coughs> restaurant, Sweet Basil in Needham. And his food is out of this world. And he makes the best pesto I have ever had. But the best part is he makes his own bread and they come over with it. It's a thick, hard crust bread and he bakes it fresh so it comes out of the oven, he cuts it and brings it over with the pesto. Four to six pieces. Anyway, 
and does it have some white flour in it? Absolutely. But I can't remember the last time I had a regular sandwich for lunch. So I save it for something that's real good. If I go to a restaurant and they bring out reheated white basic rolls, I don't even touch them, even if I'm hungry. Because if I'm going to eat something that isn't real good for me, I want to make sure it's worth it. And there's nothing wrong with that. You go out to eat, you've been good all week, and you love cheesecake, and you're at the Cheesecake Factory, have a slice, not a slab, but have a piece. <laughs> but if you go somewhere and you order cheesecake and you take a bite, and it's just, eh, it's not worth the fat and the calories. Waste the eight bucks and tell them you don't want it or send it back. So make sure everything is worthwhile, and you don't have to not have something you like. Treat It should be a treat, not a staple. Um. I guess my question is, and I've been hearing, and PBS has been doing yeah. programs on this, but people are, some people, some <coughs> doctors are saying that all gluten, period, is inflammatory, that okay. you should be, well, whole wheat is not any better than, <laughs> and no, no well, rye, no wheat. Okay, corn. so the question is gluten. Are we going overboard on gluten, or is gluten really bad? And I'll say yes to both. Where there are people who are gluten sensitive and there are people who are celiac where it's destroying the lining of the intestines, they have to eliminate all gluten. We don't digest gluten well as an animal or a mammal, but we can tolerate gluten. The problem is, there's gluten in almost every single meal and snack we're eating, so again, we're taking it to excess. So do you have to be anal and eliminate all gluten and never have any grains and all that? No, we need the grains. But just a silly thing, I never knew it. One of our friends is a chef and he said he prides himself. He has a whole area of the kitchen that's gluten free. And he has people come in and you know the menu's labeled, they don't mix the pans and all that. And there's one person that's extremely sensitive and kept having a problem whenever she ate there. And you know, she liked him and kept telling him, you're putting flour in somewhere. Lo and behold, he checked. He's buying 100% pure butter. You know, they buy the big blocks of it. And lo and behold, some of the manufacturers add some gluten into the butter when they pour it in the mold because then it sticks to the vegetables better so they're more buttery. It's not labeled, so we're putting gluten in everything. And also, if you think about it, if you look at most of the snacks and the foods we eat, we're having gluten every single meal, every single snack. We should be rotating our foods. Strawberries, wild strawberries, very good for you. You don't want to eat them three times a day, you'll eventually get a sensitivity. Because we weren't supposed to be eating them 12 months a year, three meals a day. So rotate your foods. If you are a little sensitive to rye, if you eat a five grain bread, you're not getting much of any of the grains, as opposed to eating a rye bread. And wheat is a terrible grain because there isn't any, spelt is really wheat, and the wheat that we're, everything's made out of has been so engineered to make it bug resistant and more crop, more cycles per acre per year that it's not the food that our body was designed to eat. And so, no, you, I don't think most people need to eliminate gluten. And again, moderation, we're going to the extreme. You're either an ultra-liberal or an ultra-conservative, <coughs> there's nobody in the middle, and that's what got us into the mess we're in. <laughs> How about we use our brain, and some people might have to be on that end and this end, but a lot of us can be in the middle and do things well, and moderate. Thank you. You're welcome. Like your yes. <laughs> Okay, going back to digestion, apple cider vinegar. How many remember grandma drinking apple cider vinegar or taking it? Bragg's apple cider vinegar. Um, apple cider vinegar, believe it or not, it's very acidic. So one, it's very good for digestion, unless you have a bleeding ulcer. Mo we're finding in, as we get older, the more mature people, a lot of times they have reflux because they're lacking an acid. So taking apple cider vinegar with the meal helps. And so, you know, who knows? We usually think reflux, we have too much acid, let's suppress it, and it gets worse. Then you add some acid in there and it gets better. How does that work? 
well, maybe we have the same symptom from that side and this side. Apple cider vinegar, when you take something acidic in your body, the body alkalinizes. So apple cider vinegar, believe it or not, can help balance the pH, not make it more acidic. But the best pH balancing is eating a good diet, not eating the acid, all acidifying foods, red meat and junk food. Make the body very acidic. You don't have to be drinking baking soda to balance your pH. Let your kidneys do their job. Give them the grains and the green vegetables and the fruits along with a normal amount of meat and not much processed foods and your pH will start normalizing on its own. You don't have to force it. So apple cider vinegar, very good. Another thing about apple cider vinegar, you have a sugar craving, take a shot of apple cider vinegar within minutes, deactivates the amylase and starts stabilizing blood sugar. And so it's very good for the sugar cravings. Going to natural alternatives to the NSAIDs, there's a bunch of them, Vibrazyme, very, very interesting. There's Vibrazyme, there's one company makes it, another company makes a product, Repair Gold. These are great anti-inflammatories. If you have an injured joint, these get in there and they're enzymes. You take them without food, an hour away from food, they get into the bloodstream and they go in and break down the fibrin in the injured area and release all that metabolic waste and inflammation goes down. Why do we need to take it? because we screwed up what Mother Nature gave us. Nature put in the foods all the enzymes we need to digest it. If we pick them, cook them properly, and eat them properly, our bodies make the same enzymes. But those enzymes are supposed to get into the bloodstream to work with our white blood cells to kill bacteria and viruses and to help with inflammation. Problem is, we're eating food that isn't nutrient rich, that we're killing it in the microwave or it's old so it doesn't have the enzymes so the body is diverting a lot of these protective enzymes to the digestive system to digest the food which is leaving that flank wide open to inflammation so if we eat the proper foods we can find we have less inflammation one of the reasons is because the enzymes that we make are going to where they're supposed to go to help balance inflammation so it sounds complicated, but it really isn't rocket science. Everything was there. All the pieces were there for us. And I, I use this story all the time. I talk to an elementary school class about how important digestion is and exercise and computers and iPads are great, but not too much of them and all that and what we're supposed to be doing. And this little third grader at the end said, you know what it sounds like to me, Dr. Gary? It sounds like we got the best machine in the world and we spend our whole life seeing if we can break it. <laughs> <laughs> How bright, that's another Einstein. You know, hopefully in another 30 years he'll run for president and everything will be straightened out because he gets it, what you're supposed to do. Okay, so that's the enzymes. Anyone heard of Boswellia? That's an Ayurvedic herb. It's an old, goes way, way, way back, very good easy on the stomach, anti-inflammatory. Magnesium comes in capsules, comes in flakes, you can put it in the bathtub and soak in it. Comes in a spray, you can spray it on and rub it on. Magnesium helps with pain and inflammation. One of the ways it does it, every muscle in our body there's a calcium magnesium pump. Calcium goes in and the muscle contracts. Magnesium goes in, forces calcium out and it relaxes. When you have an injury, the muscles tense up. If you don't have enough magnesium, they get tighter and tighter. And if you think about it, it's pulling on the injured joint, which makes it even worse. By getting the magnesium back in, it relaxes it. It also relaxes the mind. There's a product called Calm. Yeah. Great product, but it's great marketing because you're supposed to heat it up some water, put it in the water, make a hot tea, blow on it, and <coughs> sip it slowly. What does that do? It makes you slow down and it gets the magnesium in. So it's not one thing. If you don't do things right and you have a lousy lifestyle and you take magnesium, you're still gonna be in trouble. You have to do the lifestyle changes, the diet changes, and then you can take supplements to help. 
So it's a combination of things. Yes? Do you think magnesium is absorbed better by one route versus another? Like I've heard it's absorbed better through the skin. Well, I'll, if it's a well-formulated magnesium and your digestive system's working, magnesium is very well absorbed. It depends upon the type of magnesium too. Magnesium um, citrate, anyone colonoscopy, you drink the bottle of magnesium oh, citrate yeah. and everything below your eyeballs comes out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not absorbed well. It stays in the gut. It draws fluid in. So you get very little ab systemic absorption. Good for the gut if you're constipated. Magnesium glycinate, orotate, uh, magnesium um, glycinate, orotate, aspartate, malleate, thank you. Those are well absorbed. A little stays in the gut and a lot gets into the system. If you have restless leg or a charley horse, if you take an absorbable magnesium by mouth, it'll help. But if you spray it on and rub it in, you get it right into that spasm muscle immediately. You don't have to wait for it to go through the miles of tubes to get some of it there. You're concentrating it in that area. The downside of it is, it, some people find it stings a little as it's going through. Magnesium's a big molecule, it doesn't hurt. It's just we love things to feel wonderful. And if something's a little irritating, think about it. It's irritating, gonna increase blood flow. Bring oxygen in, bring nutrients in, that's helpful. So the topical is very, very good. One of the topicals say wash it off after 20 minutes. You don't have to wash it off. The reason for that is the vehicle makes your legs shiny. So the women wearing a skirt, you rub it on this leg, because this leg's bothering you, and four hours later someone says, what's the matter with your leg? That one's shiny and that one isn't. <laughs> they don't say that on the label. They say wash it off after 20 minutes. So everyone thinks, oh, I can't leave it on. It would be dangerous. But absorption, mag, we have a product, mag chloride in drops. Tastes disgusting because it's very, it's not salty, but it tastes salty because it's a mineral. That gets absorbed sublingually. That's the best absorption. So there's all different ways, and the right way for you might not be the right way for the next person. Curcumin. Anyone taking curcumin? Yeah. Okay. This is going to be the next probiotic and omega-3. They all laughed at probiotics a waste of time. Now doctors are writing prescriptions and it's advertised. Omega-3, fish oil is a waste of time. Now there's prescription fish oil, which isn't as good as the stuff you can buy for less money without a prescription. Curcumin is wonderful. The National Institute of Health started a study on curcumin, on inflammation. And I personally, I'm a little bit skeptical, so I really think they started this to prove it doesn't work so they can get people not to use it. And the study went so well that they've expanded it and they have multiple studies going. So they endorsed the right formulation is excellent for inflammation. They also found that it helps protect against certain cancers and they think it might even help as part of the treatment for certain cancers. So curcumin, very, very important. Out in the east and even in the Mediterranean area, they use turmeric and curcumin every single meal. It's one of the spices. They use a little bit all the time and it helps prevent problems. We always wait till something's wrong then what natural product can I use in large amounts to get back to health? So again, we're better off cooking with it and eating it. Now the important thing, that I put out these two, is on the back, whenever you buy anything, they have a, I call it the fun facts, you know, the information. There's a process, BCM-95. There's only one company that makes that and they license it to other companies. That's highly absorbable curcumin. You get phenomenal blood levels. On the 500 milligrams, it's generally one capsule a day. Some people take one twice a day at first. If you take a regular curcumin capsule, you would have to take 8, 10, 12 capsules a day to get half the blood level. And so it's cheaper to buy the bottle of the other, but it winds up costing you a lot more in the long run. Now some companies add black pepper into it, to turmeric or curcumin, and they add black pepper, and that gives you better absorption. Nowhere near the BCM95, but there's a few studies out now saying, yes, you get better blood levels of curcumin, but the active ingredients you're getting less, because it blocks some of the absorption of the active ingredients.
What does the BCM stand for? I have no idea. Okay. It has to do with, if you look it up online, they'll tell you it's words this long, the type of process. And so they just, instead of calling it the, and having to spend half a paragraph, they abbreviate it. Is it similar to curcumasorb? Okay, curcum okay, curcumasorb, the next best one is a process by a company called Mariva, and they license it to companies. The Mariva, I like because it's one to six a day, so you can really titrate the dose to what you need. For people who don't want to play around with the dose or want the most anti-inflammatory action now, I like the BCM95, you can take one a day and you're covered. But those two are the top shelf, okay? White willow bark. White, yes? So when you buy turmeric, so you yeah. the guy a um, version of turmeric with the black pepper, you would say that is a, not as good. That's problem. better than just getting turmeric in capsule form yeah. or the powder, you know, with the spice. Oh, so with the black pepper is better. Mm -hmm. Without the black pepper, you're getting very little absorption. So that's one step up, but the other two are way up here. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I was in the other room, and I didn't. I didn't. I was in the other room. I didn't yeah. hear you start on the curcumax, which is the one you're recommending. It'll say on the back under the under the facts. BCM ninety five is a process. And if anyone misses anything, we'll be here afterwards, and we can one-on-one -on -one go through it. Yes? Just one really quick question. Um, for all of these um, <coughs> anti-inflammatories, do they deal like with specific inflammation like arthritis or is it more systemic inflammation or? They, okay, good question. They deal with inflammation in the body. If you twist your knee, mm -hmm. curcumin can help. If it's due to um, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, if it's, you have systemic inflammation through your whole body, so it, yes, yes, and yes, it's far, it helps the body balance the inflammatory process really for whatever the cause is. Um, you have dental work and you get inflamed, good for that. Okay, white willow bark, very interesting. White willow bark doesn't eat a hole in your stomach and it has the active ingredient that aspirin was made from. Mm -hmm. But man, we figure we can do it nature one, we can one up nature. So we took the active ingredient white willow bark, concentrated it, put it into a tablet, and it works great. But it eats a hole in your stomach. It's very irritating to the GI system. Mm -hmm. If you take it in the plant form, you get the same dose as an aspirin tablet, and there's no GI irritation because all that other garbage that nature put in there helps balance it and protects protects us. So white willow bark is making a comeback. Cat's claw is very, very good. Omega-3, capsule form, liquid form, all different companies. You want to make sure it's pure. You want to make sure it's been cleaned because the oceans are disgusting and there's a lot of heavy metals and chemicals. And the last thing you want to do is take a healthy omega-3 with a bunch of mercury in it. And poison yourself. Yes. Is this product called Zyflamend? I'm sorry? Zyflamend? Yeah. What do you Zyflamend, it's a product. It's very, very good. It's a blend of three or four different herbs and it's excellent. Yeah. That's been around for a long time and it's still that company, one of their top products that's made by a new chapter. That's an excellent one. Um, so fish oil. What you want to do, fish oil, the government to help us. Um, you know, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you with that type of help. It used, it used to, most of the companies used to say on the front how much omega-3 is in each capsule or each teaspoon. The government now says that they want it labeled how much does the capsule weigh, the fish oil. So if you go to your doctor and he tells you to lower your cholesterol, he wants you to take 1,000 milligrams of omega-3 twice a day. You go to the store and you pick up the bottle and it says, you know, fish oil capsules, 1,000 milligram. So you say, I'll take one twice a day. Everything is great. 
What you always need to do again, look at the fun facts. This one says one soft gel has 950 milligrams of total omega-3s. Some of them have 180 milligrams, but they weigh a thousand. Mm -hmm. So a thousand of what? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to. Now another thing, some companies, this company says one soft gel has this much. Some companies will say it has a thousand milligrams. So you say, great, but then if you look at serving size, it's four capsules. Mm -hmm. So you take one because you saw it had the thousand and you're getting a quarter of the dose. So consumer beware. Ask questions wherever you're buying it. Go in and say, how much EPA am I getting per dose and what size is the dose? And if they just look at you like, huh? That, you know, walk out the door. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. People who are selling this stuff should know this stuff. Or I don't know how much is in every one, but if you ask me, which one gives me the most, or which one gives me this number of milligrams, I'll go out and grab a bunch of bottles, look at how many capsules and what it is. Because I know the information's right there. So you have to know where you're looking. Okay. Does it show where it's, you said it needed to be cleaned? How do you you know want it, that's cleaned? the different companies, and most of them will have literature with the product saying that they test it for heavy metals and chemical contaminants and all that. Most companies test to one part per million. Some of the companies test one part per billion. And so there's phenomenally good fish oil out there and there's disgusting fish oil out there. Generally speaking, and I'm not slamming anyone, big box stores have a lousy oil because they're looking to sell you the biggest bottle for the least money because then they're the hero. And it costs money to get it clean and make it pure. And to do the testing, to certify that it is. And so it doesn't have to be ridiculously expensive, but it can't be ridiculous. If it's fish oil is ridiculously cheap, you're better off not taking fish oil, even though it's important for you. Yes. Is fish oil hard on the digestion? Is fish oil hard on the digestion? I'll say no, but yes. The fat is hard on the digestion. So if someone takes a well-formulated fish oil and they're burping and having problems, they have trouble digesting fat. So again, that's the red flag. I need help with the other fats too. So you can do something. Some people, if you put them in the freezer and take them cold, you don't burp. Also take it with a meal. Okay. Um, diet, I think I've hammered this enough, is primarily to blame for an increase in inflammatory illness. We are doing this to ourselves. Just like diabetes, the majority of people who are pre-diabetic self-inflicted and if they become diabetic they did it to themselves not everybody but the vast majority of people who become diabetic it's because of our lifestyle and our diet we're doing it to ourselves the younger generation now the fat kids the obese kids I'm not picking on anyone but they're saying 70 to 80 percent of them when they get into their late 20s are going to be diabetic that's preventable and we're not doing anything about it but we have drugs for it and we have insulin. And now, you know, we're gonna be developing, or it might even be out now, you don't even have to inject, it'll, it's like Star Trek, it'll blow it right through the skin, <laughs> so you don't even have to worry about needles. How about preventing it? And then you don't have to worry about it at all. Common triggers of inflammation, frequent infections, blood sugar issues. When blood sugar's doing this, when you're eating the whites, your blood sugar's doing this, you are pumping out more and more insulin and you are pouring gasoline on any inflammation. And so you have to get that under control. Food additives, chemicals, processed foods, genetically modified foods, we weren't designed to digest them and to eat them. When you have a genetically modified food or you have an overly <laughs> processed food or foods with a lot of chemicals, the body is spending a lot of energy trying to extract nutrients from it, deactivate all the chemicals that are in there, and then eliminate it. And so it's robbing us of nutrients. And we're not getting the bang out of the food. So you really want to, ideally, I would love to be able to eat all organic, non-genetically modified foods. That isn't possible now. My wife and I went to, Fr to France a while ago and we were going through the countryside and I said to the guide, this is wonderful, they're letting the soil rest because there were a lot of acres that weren't planted. 
and he said they are letting it rest because in France they can't use genetically modified seeds mm -hmm. and they can't find enough seeds to plant the amount of acreage they have in France oh, for fruit and vegetables. How sad is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they want to do it right and they can't <coughs> buy enough seeds so they have to spread around who's not growing this year. And so, you know, it isn't good for us. And now we have the frankenfish. You know, we have a salmon, which is great. A regular salmon, a certain amount of time, will be this big. And the new one will be, what, twice or three times the size, eating half the amount of food. And it's perfectly fine to eat. It's identical to the regular fish. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what they're saying. And also, in this country, they're saying if something is cloned or genetically modified, we really don't have to have it labeled that way because it's identical. So if it's the identical thing, why label it either way? I want to know. And so, but that's me. Um, pardon me? A lot of a lot of, well, but you know, we can drive the market. It takes a while. And if you look at it, places like Stop and Shop now are expanding their healthy section. You know, the natural food area used to be that little tiny corner. Now they got, I know the one near me, they got rid of the florist shop and expanded it. And the flower shop probably makes a lot more money, but the consumers are looking for it. Stop and Shop, you could, you could sometimes find organic apples at what? Five ninety nine a pound. Now they have a whole organic section, and the price is more than the regular, but not that much more a lot of the time. And that's because you are driving it. The consumer eventually, if you stop buying things and going somewhere where they sell what you want, if there's enough of us doing it, other stores and businesses will pick up on it. Okay, this is something to help you. Unhealthy nutrients, sugar, Mitch, you were asking that. Sugar, salt, alcohol in excess, tobacco, the greases, the bad fats, saturated fats, artificial colors and preservatives. They destroy the body. We store man-made chemicals that our body can't detoxify, get stored in the fat. And so a lot of people are exercising, eating well, and getting fatter. A lot of people, when they, if they're overweight, when they do a detox and they go on a diet, they feel terrible because the body melts the fat and it releases all these toxins too fast that are buried there. People who had liposuction when that was real big, a couple of places started analyzing these big cellulite globs and they were loaded with fat-soluble chemicals. That's the body walling it off and trying to keep it out of the system. So you can do it, but you have to do it right. So you want to minimize those things. You want to add these things. Vitamins, minerals, yes, buy supplements. That's great. Eat the food. Get most of it from the food. Um, fruits, vegetables, water, unsaturated fats, complex carbs. Carb-free diet, terrible thing. Simple carb, overload, killing you. Complex carbs we need, they break down slow, get glycogen, blood sugar level for hours. Whereas simple carbs goes up and down. You feel good for 20 minutes and then you starved. So it's not that any th a type of food group is bad, it's the subgroup of that, the simple carbs. Good fats, avocado, nuts, wild salmon, olive oil, bad fats, the delicious fast food. But what's really interesting, we can train our bodies to eat foods that we shouldn't eat. Now, I've been in New England my whole life. Summertime, I love the fried, f a good fried fisherman's platter. And the bigger it is, the better it was. Clams, you never had a half pint of fried clams. You got, you went to the place that gives you the platter of fried clams. And you could eat it and tolerate it and everything was good. When you get away from that fried food, you sit down and eat it, and you're sick, and you taste it for hours. But there's nothing wrong with having a couple of them. Split it with somebody. You know, you don't have to eliminate everything, but the body gets used to it, and it likes that. Just like with, we used to love, there was only wild salmon, and we're so used to the farm-raised salmon, it's mushy. And people that always eat farm raised and you give them a good piece of wild, fresh caught wild Alaskan salmon 
are you know the North Atlantic salmon, and they don't like it. There's bones in it that you can't chew up, and it's a little bit harder. I don't want to say hard, but it's more like steak than it is mush. And they say that's not what fish should be like. No, that is what fish should be like. We got used to the wrong type of fish. Okay, this is the chart I was telling you. The N6 means omega-6. Well, it's not N, it's omega. That's from corn oil, from the fast foods. But if you eat a normal amount of omega-6, and you have the right amount of omega-3, it's going to go straight down to PEG1 and T TXA1, which you don't have to know those, but those are anti-inflammatory mediators. They help control inflammation. If you have an insulin problem, or you're eating too much white flour, and your sugar's doing this and insulin's high, or you have an overload of the omega-3s, it goes down to arachidonic acid, which then is pro-inflammatory. It causes inflammation. And that's where the NSAIDs and aspirin work. Also interesting singular is there. That's an antihistamine. And it helps with inflammation. They're using it for inflammation now because it blocks that pathway. The omega-3s on the right only make anti-inflammatory things. So it's not that omega-6s are bad. We need them. They're part of the cell membrane that allow us to get nutrients into the cells. Without omega-6s, we'd be dead. The interesting thing is we should have a balance of omega-6 to omega-3, of three parts omega-6, one part omega-3. That's a healthy balance. In our age, in our society, we're at 15 to 30 to one, omega-6 to omega-3. Instead of three to one, those of us that are eating a relatively good diet, we're around 15 to one, and the people who are eating the standard American diet are over 30 to one. So is it any wonder why inflammation is so huge and why the body can't get under control? High glycemic versus low glycemic foods. Glycemic index is how a food affects our blood sugar, how fast it makes it go up and down. You want a steady blood sugar all day. You'll have more energy, less food cravings. Your met metabolic rate goes up. Chips, biscuits, ice cream, dates, potatoes, processed foods have a high glycemic index. Within an hour, that's what your blood sugar level is, and insulin shoots up. So if you are eating those foods all the time, your insulin is very high. And I said earlier, insulin is a pro-inflammatory um, chemical in the body. If you eat basmati rice, vegetables, lentils, whole grain pasta, whole grain bread, oats and oranges, your blood sugar maintains much longer and you don't get that big spike. High glycemic diet is inflammatory. Simple carbs, again, white sugar, white flour, low protein. Um, if you eat good proteins, omega-3s and complex carbs, that has a low glycemic index and it holds you better. Any questions on that? Yeah, watermelon. Things like yeah. Okay. Water even potatoes. Okay. Watermelon, believe it or not, makes your blood sugar go up and down. Okay? Because of, but fruit has sugar too. But does that now so if you have a choice of having some watermelon or some potato or processed food or wonder bread, eat a whole watermelon. Much better for you. There's nutrients there. So some things are higher glycemic index, but it doesn't mean they're bad. But if you're living on them, it's terrible. But like root vegetables, like root, root beets and excellent. Have, yeah, but they have, they have a lot of sugar. They have, all, they have a lot of sugar, but they have all that fiber in them, and so that releases the sugar slowly, so you get the well, the over level good. over time. Okay, so it doesn't spike here. Do you have a bowl of oatmeal? throw some blueberries in it and a small handful of nuts, you'll be full for hours because the nuts, the, the blueberries give you the sugar right away and they're good for you and they taste great. The nuts take an hour or two to start breaking down to maintain blood sugar and the oatmeal is sort of in the middle. So you get that nice steady state for hours. And so it's almost like wine pairing, it's putting the foods together. So it's not that it's definitely bad for you, it's if you eat it by itself, it's bad for you, or it's not good for you. Yes? 
Do you um, give credence to the science of the combining? I read about that about not eating uh, meats with uh, carbs and things like that. Do uh, how do I feel about eating meats with carbs and eating this food with that food and fruit, not eating? Fruit too close to anything else. I'll say if you have a real serious condition, then yes, but no. It and doesn't contribute to inflammation. No, not if you're eating problems. good. No, not if the digestive system's working. Because if you think about it, in the old days when we didn't have the internet, who knew? You sat down and had a plate. But the plate had a variety of foods on it. It's if you're eating too much of something that you can throw things off. It's like I have people come in and say, you know, I don't want to take a multiple vitamin. I don't want to take my calcium with the magnesium because if you take calcium with magnesium, they compete. And if you take vitamin D with this, it competes. And if you take zinc with that, it competes. So I have to space it all out. Every hour, I'm taking a different <laughs> pill. And so, you know, I look at the research and all that, and yes, maybe if you take calcium and magnesium together, you get a little less of both. But if you think about it, go back to Mother Nature. What food has one nutrient in it only? Nature put them together, and we ate them. The monkeys are eating them, and they're healthy. And so, I would. There's more important things to worry about, I think, than. Yeah, geez, I ate my meat, so now I have to wait 20 minutes to have this with it. And so I don't think so. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean nobody should have to space things out or not eat them together, for depending upon your, your condition. But if things are working right, the body is wonderful. It'll use what it needs and take care of it. Okay. Diet, most important thing for preventing and helping with inflammation. Eat raw rather than cooked. You don't want to overcook something. Um, lean proteins, complex carbs, omega-3, fresh foods. Eat the real stuff instead of the processed stuff. We need to eliminate toxins in our body. Our liver is our main organ. When we eat things, it gets absorbed and the blood goes right to the liver to be detoxified, to get out organisms that got absorbed and toxins. Problem is, the food has so, many, so much in it and we're breathing in so many things, our liver is working overtime. And that's where fatty liver comes in. Most of the toxins, the man-made stuff, <coughs> is fat soluble. And if the liver can't get rid of it during phase one, phase two detoxing, which is when we're getting a good night's sleep and we're in REM sleep and we have a huge sleep problem in this country, in the world, but I can, I'll talk about this country, we're not detoxing well. So the liver stores it. And when it has too much fatty stuff that it's storing, it brings in fat into the liver. And we get a fatty liver. And now, mainstream, we're seeing it used to just be an odd person. Now, that's very common. So it's, gee, for your age, that's normal. Don't worry about it. We'll keep an eye on it. It isn't normal. You have a bunch of toxins starting to accumulate in your liver. And we need to do things to help support the body to detox. One of the best things in the world is food. And I keep going back to food. And I could be 300 pounds. I love to cook and I love to eat. So it's food within reason. But the cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli, the carrot, the um, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, they're very good at helping the liver with phase one, phase two detoxing. That's one of the reasons they're so healthy for us. So you want to eat foods that support digestion, that support detoxing. There's, all diff there's always a way to do it. Milk thistle, dandelion, artichoke, very tonic for the liver. It doesn't force a detox. It allows the body to work at the best speed it can. Um, there's herbal tinctures, dandy comp and hepaticomp. Homeopathically, there's support for the liver. There's detox drops, support the liver and the lymphatic system. There's all different ways to do it. These are all supportive. They don't force a detox, and it's very, very good. Some women get migraines right around that period. That's the liver being overloaded, a menstrual migraine. By doing liver support, usually that helps clear it up. People, women who break out right before the period of ovulation, 
The body's trying to get rid of the extra estrogen and progesterone. The liver's overloaded, comes out through the skin and feeds the bacteria on the skin and you get pimples. You clean up the digestive tract and do some liver support and that usually clears up. So we have all these signals. That's an inflammatory process. Um, so supporting the liver, very, very important. Digestive support, multi-strain probiotic is, some of them go a few billion up to 200 billion. You don't need mega, sometimes you need mega doses, but in general, it's like grass seed. You're overseeding the lawn. You need some every day. You don't need huge amounts if you're healthy. So some of them are higher doses, some are lower doses. Um, SBO, soil-based organisms. Years ago, we pulled the food out of the ground, wiped it off and ate it. There were organisms, there were bugs on it, you know, little microscopic mm -hmm. ones. They were healthy. Now the soil's contaminated, we use contaminated water to water it, so we irradiate it, so we're not getting the billions of soil-based organisms. I've got needs. Very important, you want to always look, it should be a multi-strain, have 10, 12, 14 different strains, and at least a few billion in there. So there's all different ones there. Um, talk about that. For our blood sugar regulation, people who are having their blood sugar or insulin going up and down, insulin resistance. You don't have to wait till you need to be put on insulin or on glucophage. There's things you can do. There's look at the ingredients in this. It's a multiple vitamin and it has a lot of the nutrients the body needs for stabilizing blood sugar and absorbing it. How many like cinnamon? One of, besides curcumin, excellent. If you have blood sugar issues or insulin resistance, if you eat, get sleepy, that's a blood sugar problem. You should eat and feel better and get more energized. But if you go down, you're going hypoglycemic because you're insulin resistant and the sugar, the glycogen isn't getting into the cells into the brain. Cinnamon bark twice a day, two capsules, breakfast and supper can help with insulin resistance and help stabilize blood sugar. Nice natural product. Or you can take glucophage if you're having a little problem. And one of the big side effects is diarrhea. And when you have diarrhea, that the pill doesn't get fully absorbed. It goes through the body faster, so they give you more of it because you're not absorbing it as well. So we'll take it four times a day instead of once a day. You know, really. What, uh, what about chromium for blood okay. uh, yep. sugar? Stuff? We need a certain amount of chromium, vanadium, alpha lipoic acid to help with blood sugar. And it's like making chicken soup. You need a whole bunch of ingredients. And if you only put two of them in in large amounts, the soup is terrible. Uh, so you need some of everything. Diaxanol, this product, has biotin, chromium, alpha lipoic acid, cinnamon, and vanadium. One twice a day. Not If you look at the doses, you say, well, gee, I don't want to take just uh, on, what is this, on chromium, 800 micrograms. I need a lot more than that if you're trying to force the body with one nutrient. But how about giving the body some of everything it needs and let the body work? So that's it. How do you know what to take? You talk to us or you talk to somebody because everyone's different. And what one person needs, somebody else might not need. What was that called again that you just told me? Diaxanol. D-I-A-X. Sorry. D-I-A-X-I-N-O-L. So if you start getting the body in balance, does everyone need liver support today? No. Does everyone need digestive support? No. They might. Digestive enzymes. There's all different ones. There's Digest Basic is one of them. That's a low dose, but it has like 14 different enzymes. It covers all food groups, but it's a little bit of support. Digest Gold is a high-level support for people who really need a lot of enzymes. Optizyme has bile in it. People who have had the gallbladder out, you still need bile, but you're not concentrating it. So this has the enzymes plus bile. So some people might take this, and if they're not making enough bile, they say it really didn't help. They take something with some bile in it. That's wonderful. It's not rocket science, it's just you got what the body was looking for and the body's working better. So we have toxins in and toxins out. If you are eating some food that's a little dirty or generating free radicals, but the body can deal with it, you're in good shape. The balance is even. 
and that's what you want. When there's more toxins in the body and fewer are going out because the liver is congested or you're eating more than the you're eating the wrong stuff and the body can't take care of it, the toxic burden increases, you generate more free radicals and you get sick, it feeds inflammation and pain level goes up. So it's really a simple equation. Bad stuff coming in, if it all goes out, it's a wash and you're fine. Pain, you can start this cycle and go in any direction. If you're not sleeping well, you're more anxious and you're not cleaning so you're more toxic which lowers your mood. If your mood is down, you're usually not doing as much activity. If you're not as active, energy's off. What if you're not sleeping well? You have bad energy, which affects your sleep. And it goes around, so you can go either way. So it doesn't really matter what was first, the chicken or the egg. You have to break the cycle, or you're never going to get rid of pain. Anyone use an infrared sauna? Okay. There, it used to be, that was what they did out in California where all the West Coast nuts were, and it was one of these la 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 things. Now they've proven it really works. Saunas are great, but the problem with a sauna is you have to really get the heat way up to heat up the body, to increase the blood flow, to cause the sweating, to get the sweat out. And saunas are great. They now have come out with, they're called far infrared saunas. It has infrared generators in there also, so it's a much lower heat. The infrared penetrates deeper into the tissue, so it heats you up from within out, so you sweat faster. It gives you the effect of exercise. It gets the heart rate up, the blood flow up. <coughs> it helps you detox. Usually your perspiration really has an odor, not a body odor, but it has a, a different odor than when you just sweat because a lot of the impurities are coming out of the body and there's some lousy companies and some good companies I wound up buying one and it was great it comes in like eight pieces it has clips on the side and I wound up carrying each piece in myself because I couldn't wait for my son to come over to help and the only time I had a problem was getting the top piece on because I have to hold it over my head and walk in <laughs> to the room but it's idiot proof setting it up and it's wonderful it really is that's a great way to detox it also makes you sit for 20 minutes or a half hour and relax mm -hmm. and that's just as therapeutic as the infrared sauna we don't do that and the other thing is a lot of people started bringing their phones in or their iPads <laughs> heat is terrible for the battery on <laughs> your $500 iPad so they tell you you can bring it in but it's going to destroy the battery, which is a great thing. So <laughs> then you leave it outside. So I saw online one company has made something that you stick on the outside to hold your iPad <laughs> so you can see it. So you spent a couple of thousand dollars on this and you're not getting the maximum benefit. But that's excellent. <laughs> when we sleep, we rest, rebuild, and reduce cortisol. Cortisol is important, fight or flight. Cortisol is very inflammatory. When cortisol is high, you don't digest food well. You don't repair. When you don't get a good night's sleep, just a normal breakdown of a normal day, you don't repair it, so you're one step behind the next day. If you have a sleeping problem, and you're not getting anywhere from five to seven hours of good REM sleep a day, you're priming your body for pain, inflammation, and disease. So we need to get sleep. And sleep isn't, I'm going to take three Benadryl and knock myself out. Then you're not aggravated because you're not up pacing, but you're not getting any REM sleep. So it didn't do you any good as far as the body goes. So remember, rest, rebuild, and reduce cortisol. So we talked about Boswellia, magnesium, the omegas. That's the best direction. That food and lifestyle bring you on the road to pain relief and to decrease inflammation. And I really don't care. You have severe osteoarthritis. If you clean up your diet, get a good night's sleep, a happy lifestyle, good relationships, and take time for yourself, your pain level will go down. Because if you don't do those things, 
pain level definitely goes up. So it, it's one of the few gimmies, except taxes will go up and we'll all die eventually. <laughs> but if you do the wrong things, you're going to get sick, and if you do the right things, you can feel better. That's 100%. Mm -hmm. Nutrition, whole foods, eliminate toxins, sleep, sunshine, activity, relationships. Bad relationships are one of the most toxic things for the body. It's worse than some of the man-made chemicals because that gets into your subconscious and it's 24 hours a day, not just when you're exposed to the person. So you have to have good relationships. Don't go out and dump somebody or kill somebody, but work on the relationships. And if you can't change it, learn how to deal with the stress so it doesn't tear you down as much. There's a, a program we have, we launched it through the Academy of Integrative Medicine a few years, I think two years ago, called um, the Fresh Start Program. And I just wanted to throw that out. It's a great pro, whoops. It's a great program because it's a six month long program. And it, keep hitting that, it, it works we meet twice a month, 15 minute meeting and a half hour meeting. It makes you a person accountable because every meeting we have a project for the next meeting. They're very easy and it's at your own speed. It includes the first month supplements, but it talks about healthy eating, low glycemic food, mm -hmm. lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different program for every single person because every single person needs something different. A lot of people can do it on their own with some guidance, but some people need to be held accountable and some people need to be told, these are the 10 things we have to learn how to do. And so, again, there's a procedure for everyone and there isn't one that's right for everyone. So that's available. Um, you, first, you keep track of what you're eating. Not so I can say you had two pieces of cheesecake this week. There's no judgment, but it's more if all of a sudden you're eating the bad foods, that'll let me know to say, how are you feeling? And you're probably going to say, you know what, my arthritis is worse, or my prostate's bothering me. And we can tie it into the food a lot of times so you can see a cause and effect. And most of us, if we see that cause and effect, like eating, eliminating gluten and white flour and white sugar, then eating it and feeling lousy, then all of a sudden the light bulb goes on, that makes me feel lousy. But we've been eating it for 10 years and we never thought of that because it was all the time. So that's very good. It offers care, encouragement, support, and accountability. And most of us need some sort of accountability, just like going to the gym. If you meet a friend at the gym, you go more often because you, you don't want to disappoint them. But for yourself, you'll make excuses, well, I'll go tomorrow, and you don't get there. And that's it. I hope that was helpful. Yes. There's an article written, Tom Brady's got this very strict diet. Yeah. One of the things it actually said is stay away from nightshades, which I don't think, I, don't, I never heard of the term nightshade before. Okay. But the nightshades, the uh, peppers, uh, that stuff. He said they're not anti-inflammatory, they're rather inflammatory. Now, the reason why I bring it up is, is there, is there benefit to an inflammatory? In, well, we talk okay. about that. Some people don't digest or process nightshades well, and it can really cause digestive problems and bad inflammation. Other people can eat, you know, like apples, eat tomatoes, you know, four or five a day, have a tomato salad, eat a, um, you know, in the summer, the um, buffalo mozzarella cheese, some fresh basil and tomatoes, and you can make a meal out of that. Other people have a little and they feel terrible. Tom Brady probably has an issue with nightshades. So all that? those type of food, tomatoes, tomatoes peppers, egg and so there's eggplant. I honestly don't know. <laughs> I do. Yes. Actually, they're all part of the deadly nightshade hey, family. That makes sense. And so okay. they're, that's why, like, a lot of times those their leaves are poisonous. You know, you have to check, but um, they're, they're just all in that same family. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that, is that just like someone who has celiac disease should eliminate, has to eliminate 100% of gluten, but do you? Yeah. No. But that makes them very sick and it doesn't affect you. So it's more, my mentor, Dr. Hens, is, was a, he's passed on, but he was a brilliant man. And we always asked him as he was getting older, please write some books. 
so more people can share in this information. And he said he would never write a book. And he said the reason being is he wanted to train a bunch of us to get the information out. He said because you can have 10 people with a digestive disorder or an inflammatory disorder, and all 10 of them might have somewhat the similar protocol, but all different protocols. And if you write a book, you see them all the time. I cured adrenal fatigue by doing this. I cured fibromyalgia with this. It might work for 10 people and not the next 30 because we're all different. So he, has a, he might have a nightshade issue. Someone else might say, if I don't eat tomatoes and the nightshades, I feel lousy. Because, so, you know, should you eliminate all nightshades? No. Should you eat tomatoes? I call them the cellophane tomatoes, you know, the ones in the middle of the winter that come in those plastic tins. <laughs> <laughs> You're better off chewing on concrete, I think, it tastes better. I don't eat that many tomatoes in the winter. We, we were meant to eat food seasonally when they're in season. We shouldn't be eating strawberries now. Strawberries don't grow in North America, in this part of the country, in the middle of the winter. But then again, springtime, I gorge, like a bear with the blueberries, I gorge my, I shouldn't, but I gorge myself because the season's so short. Now I'm eating a lot more of the root vegetables. That's what we should be eating. And this season, it's amazing. The weather's been so good that a lot of the greens, the hardy greens, the kale and that type of stuff, they're still, the farmers are still harvesting them because they haven't frozen solid yet. So, you know, everything in moderation, but try to rotate foods. Yes? Is this approach good for like all types of pain, like nerve pain Yeah. as well? Because any type of pain, there's inflammation in there. Now, the inflammation is with the nerve. There's some things you can do. The omega-3s are very good for the nerve pain because the lining, the myelin sheath is made of omega-3 and we don't have enough in our diet. So that can be helpful. There's a product called, somewhere here, Neuropain, it's a homeopathic, that helps normalize the firing of the nerve in a lot of people, so that can be helpful. But anti-inflammatory protocols or lifestyle is good for any type of inflammation and any type of pain, because they're all from the same thing. They're just different tissues that are affected. What was the name of that? This one is neuro, N-E-U-R-O, pain, P-A-I-N. Very good for nerve <coughs> pain. Yes? How do, you, how do you feel about the book, Wheat Belly, by Dr. Davies? He talks a lot about the toxins and all the problems with wheat. I think that book is excellent, along with the PH Miracle is excellent, but I don't go along with everything the PH Miracle says. It talks about what you can take to force your pH. And there was a book on cancer that talked about if in a petri dish, if you have that medium in there is alkaline, cancer cells can't grow, and if it's acidic, they flourish. So we had people taking baking soda because they want to put they have cancer, they want to push their pH up to eight or nine, so cancer can't grow. That can help the cancer cells, but the body needs a pH part of the day a little below seven and part of the day a little above. So what you're doing is if you push it way up high for too long, you eliminate a lot of metabolic processes and you're gonna cause all sorts of other problems. Same thing, if you're eating wrong and you're too acidic, the body has to be a little alkaline for some of the functions. And if you don't let it swing to the alkaline for 12 hours, you're dead in the water or you will Sounds be. Like so Wheat Belly, very good book. Mm -hmm. anal, be anal about it? No. But we shouldn't be eating wheat because it isn't wheat. Or we should be eating wheat, but you can't find it. You know, you can find spelt, which is really the original ancient wheat. And so wheat belly, if you eat too much wheat, you get sick. If you eat too much carbs, anyone <coughs> that is blowing up, you know, a lot of people are bikini, they're good for the bikini from here down and here up, but right here they have the spare tire, that's a blood sugar problem, which is an inflammatory issue. So it's all tied together, there's no one problem. So I guess one of the things besides everything we talked about to, as a take home is that if you have good digestion, good lifestyle, reasonable diet, and good relationships, whatever, it's almost like snake oil, 
it's going to help everything because the body is able to deal with a lot more. It's not that it's a wonder cure, it's what we need. You wouldn't add water to your gas tank to save money on fuel. Why? Because then you have to buy a $30,000 car. You can't buy a new body. Give it the right fuel. Kerosene or diesel fuel runs an engine and gasoline does. But would you put diesel fuel in a regular car and put regular gas in a diesel? No, because you'll ruin it. So why put the wrong fuel in your system and expect it to work? And you give it the right fuel, right octane, the car runs better and gets better mileage. It's not a surprise. Okay. Thank you. And if anyone Thank has you. other questions, we'll meet you upstairs. Thank you so much. I have Alex's mom. Yes. And she's been testing me like crazy. Okay.